Alrighty, folks. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. This is the part where you respond good morning back. There it is. Love it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Uh, so let us uh, get started. Uh, I'm going to pray and then uh, we'll be off to the races. So let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for another day. We recognize that every blessing in our life is from you and you alone. God, be with us as we study your word. Be with us as we are with one another. God, you are present. You always have been and you always will be. It is in and through your son's name we pray. Amen. So, we are. We decided last week to slow down uh, because I was sweating up here and um, was moving much too quickly and we weren't going to have hardly any interaction as a group and it was going to be super luxury and fun for almost no one. So um, I uh, I have printed out some, uh, some stuff for y'all. I don't know if I made it to that table. I'm going to grab some. Um, I have some on here. But this is just Acts chapter 1 printed out, and we are, absolutely, um, and we are today, I have a PowerPoint ready for all of uh, stuff for Acts chapter 1, and if we get to it, we get to it, and if we don't, hey, we got next week and every week after that. So, um, let's, uh, let's get started, maybe. So, Quick recap, we have all of our major themes in Acts. We have Christology in Acts, pneumatology, theology, and ecclesiology. So we're looking at Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and the church in Acts. And those have a bunch of sub-themes that we will be looking at as well, um, including, but not limited to, the church's witness, egalitarianism in Acts. And we're talking both about the role of women and just general... Uh, God breaking down every barrier that we as society have and that they in society had as well um, to form God's church. Uh, the inclusion of Gentile believers actually kind of goes under that heading as well. What discipleship might look like in Luke slash Acts and the apparent anti-Semitism that may come up, that does come up. So, uh, apparent. Apparent. Yeah, no, there's no inherent. That's part of the big thing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so we are uh, we're looking at Acts as sort of a symphony, right? And so there's a couple reasons we're doing that. One is because it breaks down pretty well that way. We see a prelude. We see the first part of it, second movement, third movement, and an interlude. Um, and so what we're... What we're going to be doing, one of the reasons we see it that way is because in a symphony, it's not a solo, right? It's not just consistent. One instrument is, the, it's not a piano concerto. It's not a violin concerto. What it is, is it's lots of instruments, lots of voices coming together to form one story. And so that story has a lot of different parts, moving pieces, much like a symphony. And so right now we are in the prelude. The prelude famously in a symphony will set up so many of the themes that are going to be used throughout the entire thing. And so Acts 1 and 2, what we're doing today, really does set up what it looks like uh, thematically for the rest of the book of Acts. And so we've broken it down. If we remember, we have taken Acts verse 1, 8. Does anyone, can anyone read out Acts 1, 8 off of the sheet for me? Yes. So we see, prelude, you will be my witnesses. And then we've broken it down. In Jerusalem and Judea is the first movement. Second movement is Samaria and elsewhere, because it kind of jumps. And the third movement is to the ends of the earth. So we're taking Acts 1.8 as what we call our programmatic thesis. So this is setting up what the rest of the book is going to look like. And this is within our prelude. So that is our um, structural kind of breakdown. Our literary features, we're going to be looking at lots of speeches. That's a big part of this. That was huge in uh, early Near Eastern uh, literature and especially first century stuff. So think um, lots of like Plato and Socratic 
stuff in that kind of Mediterranean and Near Eastern literature. So that's very famous as well. Summary statements like Acts 2, we're going to get to that hopefully next week, maybe. Um, repetition, we see a lot of the same stories retold, and for good reason, and we're going to look at why those reasons might be. Um, Old Testament references, salvation history, that's a big part of why we're even doing this, is because Acts, maybe more than any other book, sees what we call the meta-narrative of Scripture. So we see this long, overarching story of what God has been doing in the life of the Israelites, and the life of Israel itself, through and across time into the inclusion of Gentiles. Um, we see lots of healing stories and the fulfillment of Israel's hopes. Um, and lots of first and third person switching. We're going to talk about what it means uh, to have an eyewitness account versus a first-hand account recorded by someone else um, and why that might be important. So we, are, we're, we have broken it down, Acts 1 and 2, into this part here. Um, which is, if you have a Bible, it's probably going to have this a similar structural breakdown. That'll change here and there, but lots of scriptural, scriptural translators have done the exact same thing that I have done here. Um, so we have walked through most of the promise of the Holy Spirit. We got almost all the way through that last week. So quick recap on all of that, and then we'll get into Ascension and Matthias. So Acts 1, 1 through 5, promise of the Holy Spirit. We talked about Theophilus. Does anyone remember what we talked about, Theophilus? Was or wasn't a real person? Probably the sponsor, exactly. So very likely someone who uh, bankrolled the writing of this and Luke's kind of research and stuff. But Theophilus just means beloved of God or lover of God and likely stood in as sort of a representative individual um, for the entire community of faith. Uh, and then we moved into Acts 1, 3, many convincing proofs, resurrection appearances. We've gone through all of this, 40 days, um, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. We talked about other times in scripture. We're talking about the time in the wilderness, the time on the ark, time in the desert with the Israelites, and time of Ezekiel's preparation before his entire uh, ministry as a prophet began. So thematically, what do these all have in common? Very likely, uh, well, my answer is that God is doing a new thing. So in the time of 40 days, it's a time of preparation. We see that in Lent. We see that um, in lots of different places. Um, 40 days, may probably not a literal 40 days, could be. Why not? Uh, just means a good bit of time. I think it was JB who said, it's long enough for something abnormal to become normal, which is a great way to put it. Like if someone's living with you for 40 days, that's longer than a guest, but not quite as long as like a brand new roommate, right? And so that is, it's long enough for something abnormal to become normal. Um, and it's preparing people for this new thing. This new thing being the promise of the Holy Spirit and the coming, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God um, being taught as it's brought forth. That is... Uh, and I think that's where we stop. So we are now slowing down. <laughs> uh, now, while, while staying with them, Acts 1-4, while staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So one of the things that I saw when I was going through, um, in preparing for all of this, when I was reading through, there were certain things that stood out to me. And so a lot of the times it's me, when, I, when you see it kind of italicized, that's something that stood out to me. doesn't mean we have to stay with it. Um, if there's something that stands out to you, we can talk about it. Please stop me. We actually have time now, so please jump in. Um, we have the promise of the Father. That's the coming of the Holy Spirit. We saw that in Luke. We saw Jesus saying, it's actually better for me to go so that this thing can come, right? This is the comfort or the promise of the Holy Spirit coming. Um, now, while staying with them, I thought this was very interesting. Um, the literal translation for staying with them in the Greek means sharing salt. How could this change its meaning? Salt was currency. Salt was currency. Okay, so there was some... There was some sharing of material wealth, right? 
what else could sharing salt mean? Say it. Yes, absolutely. Pain. Now that's interesting. Oh, I thought you said paid. Okay. Now pain. That's. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I really like that a lot. Salt. It's preservation. It's also food, right? And that was one of the things that I was, it's the breaking of the bread. So while staying with them, literally sharing salt, what is, how does this change its meaning? While staying with them, eating with them, sharing materials, being part of this community with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem. So it wasn't necessarily this edict from on high. Sure, it was because he's God incarnate, but also he's with them. There's no, there's no point where Jesus in this 40 days is apart from them. This is, he's following these same things. And so that's an interesting thing as well. Now, um, Jesus, now this is one of the fascinating things with me. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What did John's, how do I want to ask this question? So Jesus' entire public ministry started with the baptism of John, right? That's noted in every one of our Gospels. This is the point where the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus bookends his ministry, the start of it and the end of it, with the baptism. First with the baptism of John, next with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Why would Jesus, or at least Luke recording Jesus, go to su such lengths literarily, so right now we're treating this as a piece of literature as well as a piece of written theology. Why would Jesus, or at least Luke, go to such lengths literarily to connect the beginning and the end of Jesus' ministry with baptism? It was. Very good. <laughs> so you've done some homework. That's fine. <laughs> uh, so he said this was a Greek storytelling device to do a bookend kind of thing. Uh, we'll talk more about what's called a chiasm, where we see something repeated at the very front and the very end and what's in the middle is important. That could be what's happening here. Um, what else could it be? Yes. 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 I love that. Yes, so we talked about that too, right? Last week, how the, um, how the Holy Spirit is the enabling agent of power for the entirety of the church, like without which nothing would have happened. So we're talking about baptism. That's another thing that we're um, going to be moving into some more. So Acts chapter 6. Can someone read off 6 and 7? Go for it. The thing that interested me here was what happens before this, we've got 40 days of the teaching of the kingdom of God, right? So we've got, and it says very specifically, kingdom of God, and they say kingdom to Israel, right? And so there's still some sort of an expectation. This is why I love Acts so much, because it's like, there's, if they were going to tell a really, really good story, they would make all of their characters understand the story, <laughs> and they just don't. Like, I love the disciples so much because they just don't get it after so much time spent with Jesus. So they're spending 40 days learning, being taught about the kingdom of God, and they still ask, right, 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 right. So our thing. So let's get back to the kingdom of Israel. That's what you're here for. And where am I going to be? Yeah, that's a big part of it. Where am I going to rank it all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first and last, last and first. Who's going to sit at the right hand? they are still expecting some sort of a materialistic, physical kingdom to come, right? There, is, there was this, we, I'm sure you all have heard about this at this point, being in church so much. There was the first century messianic expectation that 
the Messiah was going to come and overthrow the Roman Empire. It was going to totally and completely liberate this kind of militant um, leader who was going to come and overthrow. And what they got was their king riding in on a donkey to die, right? That is so different. And so they thought that it was done, and then he got up out the grave, right? He came back, and now he's teaching. And they're like, oh, good. So our hope for the materialistic kingdom of Israel is not gone. And so he says, I love this, because what it is, is it's this first century messianic expectation, and it's, he doesn't give an answer, does he? He replied, it's not for you to know the times. He doesn't say anything about the kingdom of Israel. He's like, I, that is so far. It's like when you're talking with someone and you realize that you guys are so far from understanding each other, you're not going to cross paths. <laughs> so there's no way to even respond to the question without saying like, okay, so hmm, we can't even deal with that right now <laughs> because that's so far from the, because the kingdom of God is so utterly disinterested in the borders that we put. This is sort of this egalitarian theme coming back again, where it's not interested in kingdom of Israel versus kingdom of the Greeks or the Romans or the Persians or the Babylonians or any other um, empires that had um, sprung up. There's a quote that I love, I should have put it in here, that said something to the effect of God... It was something to the effect of God is utterly against empires and, couldn't, and could not love the nations more. And so this idea of empires, the ones who are going to be in power, the ones who can take the power and oppress, take the power and rule, because there's no, we have no king but Christ, right? And so this idea of the kingdom to Israel, the kingship of Israel, saying, no, 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 no. Your king is God. We love the nations. We bring all the nations together. But your kingdom will not be in Israel. Your kingdom will be in the hands and the lordship of God alone. So that is another thing that's gonna, that is so lovely here. <laughs> Ascension of Jesus. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one of the other things, like, well, um, we talked about how there are, um, there was the time in, um, there was the end of the Old Testament. It ends with, like, Ezra and Nehemiah, right? That's chronologically anyway. Then we have about 400 years between that and the um, timeline that starts with the Gospels. And during that intertestamental period, we have what's called the Maccabean Revolt. And the Maccabean Revolt was this huge, um, kind of groundswell of kind of a grassroots groundswell campaign of the oppressed Israelites rising up led by a guy named Judas Maccabeus to go and uh, they won and this was actually the uh, the purpose of uh, Hanukkah right this was the miracle of Hanukkah was the Maccabean um, revolt and win and there were plenty of people within even the time of Jesus and before the time of Jesus who were so, uh, they were called zealots is the, is the words. And we'll have a couple times in Acts, they'll talk about people who were zealots who either raised themselves up as messiahs or followed people who claimed to be messiahs and they were this militaristic kind of messiah that was the expectation. So very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the thing. Like, Jesus died the death of a zealot. That was a very standard thing um, for a zealot to be, because it was. <laughs> the, um, the difference with Jesus and the rest of these zealots was so much about the materialistic kingdom and this point that he was not coming to be a military leader. He was not coming to oppress, not coming to be a king. He was coming to not coming to be a king who rode in on, on a stallion bearing a sword. But even in Revelation, when we see the Son of Man coming, he is riding in on a stallion with a sword that comes out of his mouth and a robe dipped in blood. That's this militaristic thing, but that blood is his own. He died 
he was a king that would rather die than kill his enemies. That's the point of, that's why Jesus has the staying power and why he himself uh, is divine. So, we get to Acts 1, chapter 8. So, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, big deal, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Um, this is our table of contents, right? Um, we're talking Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Not only that, but we're also looking at the fact that Peter, John, Philip, and Paul are going to be our main characters in these areas. So Peter is in Jerusalem. Peter and John are in Jerusalem and Judea. They're together. And Philip is in Samaria. Well, he has a very small part in this book, but it is utterly important. And then Paul is the one who is, uh, we're going to, going to be the focus on to the ends of the earth, which is basically 9 to 28 chapter-wise, um, witnesses. So this is one of my favorite things about this. What does it mean to be a witness? Why would Jesus call us to be his witnesses and not his, his inheritors or his actors in the world, his successors? What is it, what's the difference between being a witness and being a successor or an inheritor? There you go. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 I love that. That's exactly right. There is no... I, I just used this phrase, and I'm going to absolutely undercut myself here. There's no main character in Acts. Like, we have lots of people who move in and out of the story at random intervals, and they just never show up again. That's the point of Acts, that there is no main character. Paul has a big part in it, but it's not Paul's story. Paul's story gets told in Acts, but the whole of Acts is not his story. Philip's story gets told in Acts. It's not about Philip or Peter or John or any of the people. It's not about Luke. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why um, one of the books that I've been using is called Acts, the Gospel of the Spirit. And that's what it is. This is about the power of the Holy Spirit, that it's not any human that's in charge. It's the Spirit of God. There we go. Yes. Oh, I love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's more that it is, it's not... Uh, there is still an action to be done, right? It's not that there is, but it's not us calling on our own power to be anything. It's just pointing to something. <laughs> That's what it is to be a witness. Yes? Yeah. Yes. And you have to remember the time frame they were in, witnesses were incredibly important to the oral traditions because mm -hmm. uh, nothing was really written down. Right. Yet. So if you had witnesses, you were, I mean, the story was that much more impactful than somebody just relaying something they had heard. Yes. Because of the oral traditions at the time. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly right as well. The, the whole thing with witnesses, um, I think one of the things that this does for me is it changes my view every time I think too deeply about it, which I'm grateful for, because it's not actually on me to do a darn thing. It's just a point to something that's already been done. You know? Like, every time that we're going to see Peter and John and Philip and Paul, they, when they, even when they heal, they, they always and every time say, like, yeah, it's not me, man. Like, there's a point, I think, in Acts 3 where Peter is going to be in front, of, um, in front of a council and he's been arrested, and that happens a bunch in this book. But he is going to say, man, I... I can't do anything but just tell you what happened. And I can't serve men. I serve God. That's my whole bit. <laughs> like, I can't do anything else. That's what it is to be a witness, to continually point to something else. Uh, and then we have... Uh, oh, did I put this in twice? Hey, I might have. Uh, all right, 9 and 10. Who's got it? All right. What's that? 
what stands out outside of what I've italicized, or maybe what I italicized. What do we see? I'll be more specific. What does this remind us of? The baptism, that's one thing. Where else have we seen two, two men in white robes? There we go. Exactly right. The ascension narrative is liturgically, this is 40 days after the resurrection and, I don't know, uh, days before Pentecost. That's kind of, that's one of the things we put, uh, we put a set number in our liturgical calendar, but here it's wildly unclear. And um, then 11, they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this does harken back to the angels at the tomb in Luke's resurrection narrative. Um, and it says, while they were perplexed about the empty tomb, suddenly two men in dazzling white robes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. One of the interesting things that I love about this passage is this verse specifically. Um, it does harken back to the resurrection narrative, but it puts this on par. So we think about the res we think about the resurrection. We think about crucifixion, resurrection, coming again. Right? Those are real big stuff. We, we even say Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That's the mystery of faith. But this, the ascension narrative puts this on par with the resurrection narrative. So why would it be important that Jesus isn't here? We've talked about it some, but what does it mean for Jesus to not be here and for us to still be? What does it require of us? Or what does it do for us? What would you say? Faith. Exactly right, right? Like this requires something of us. Now the interesting thing is we've been told that even though Jesus has been taken up into heaven and will come again in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. We're in this middle part where it hasn't happened yet, but this has already happened. It's this, what in theology is often called the already, not yet, right? That we see that the kingdom has come in a certain kind of way. It's been inaugurated, but the fullness of it has not been completed. And we're in this interstitial period where it's just middle parts. And this ascension is put on par with both the resurrection and the second coming. Because it requires something of us, but it doesn't require us to be heroes. It doesn't require us to be inheritors and successors, but just witnesses. So I'm loving that this is... Witnesses is going to be such a big part of this whole thing. Because it requires something of us, but no more than pointing to what God has already done. I guess I put it in... Oh, there it is. Oh, this is great. Um, in both cases, what the, white, what the uh, angels, the figures in the white robes do, is to point the attention of the disciples in a different direction. In the first, they tell the women no longer to look in the empty tomb. In the second, they tell the disciples to cease looking at the sky but rather simply to trust, have faith, that Jesus will return. Um, so like we were talking, um, the 40 days, the 40 days always precedes something new happening. These men in white robes in both situations are telling them, look somewhere else. There's something else going on entirely. This is over. Whatever this was, it's done. And we have to move on to something else now. Um, and this is the part of the 40 days, this preparation for what is coming. So that is, uh, before we move on to Matthias chosen to replace Judas, anything from Acts 1, 1 through 11. And before we move on to Acts, this next section of Matthias chosen to replace Judas, anything from y'all in regards to Acts 1, 1 through 11? We've done a really lovely line by line by line. We're getting to know it really well. It's the same thing. I promise it gets interesting. Uh, Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, think about the, the transfiguration. What does Peter want to do? Does anyone remember what Peter wants to do during the transfiguration? He want, yeah, and he's told what? Don't, right? Because it doesn't, like, this thing, it's already, we want to live in these spaces where something amazing has happened. We want to live in these spaces where, like, oh, the transfiguration has happened. Oh, the baptism has happened. The resurrection has happened. The ascension has happened. We want to sit and dwell on these things. And there's a part of it that's like, yeah, do your processing, but, like, you got to move on. One of the things I love about the story of Peter stepping out of the boat, right, is he's walking, he's walking, he starts to sink, he gets saved. And what does Jesus do? Does anyone know, actually, before I move on, what happens directly after that story? They don't go and rest. They immediately go and do ministry. There's no time to sit with this amazing thing that just happened. And that's part of this. That's part of the Christian life, though. Like, as amazing as these things are, they have to affect us, but life has to move on, right? Like, these things cannot be the only thing that we sit and think about. They have to, because we'll be failing. Like, that's, how can we witness to something if we never say anything about it? How can we witness to something if we never point to it, if we're just sitting there at it? We cannot do the thing we're called to do if we're not away from it, pointing back at it. There's a part of this that is active, but why are you still here? It's already happened. There's nothing more that's going to happen. Get going. There's stuff to do. This thing is over. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes. 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 Yeah. I agree, and I think that there's a fear almost that when we when we feel something special, we'll never feel that thing again. So we want to sit in that moment. We want to capture that moment. But the reality is, I mean, we've seen in the disciples' lives, and we know in our lives. These things happen, and we can't make them happen, one. And they happen more when we're not looking for them. Absolutely not. It's like in the, in, the, in, the, in the Eucharist, when we say the Sanctus, right? The holy, 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 right? There's a part of it where we say, right before, it's the, the pre-Sanctus, where we say, um, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. There's this moment in time that we believe, theologically, believe that this is happening, that this is, a, this, is a, this is a break in the moment of space and time where all of heaven and earth are singing this song, the, the Sanctus, here and now. So it's a break. It's apocalyptic in some ways because it's a revealing. Apocalypse just means a revealing. It's a revealing of what is real, that this moment in time is, is beyond time itself. And it is this mystical moment that we are having. Whether we recognize it as such or not, it is what we theologically are saying we believe is happening. And so this, like, move on, we got work to do, these things happen far more often than we think. Right. Even if, and you can't ever capture it on film. You can't ever capture it in a picture. You can't capture this stuff. Because you have to experience it. And you have to keep living life to continue to experience these things. Sitting there in these moments that are beautiful, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to be sitting here remembering. And that's beautiful. But there's a part of this that's like, don't look back at what happened. Let it affect you. But don't hearken, don't desire that that be the only thing that ever happened to you. There's more life left to live. And we've got something new coming on the horizon. Good Thank you for bringing that up, JB. That was awesome. So um, let's see. We have we got a little bit of time. Um, can anyone read for me 1, 12 through 14? Anyone got it? Yes, ma'am.
Anything we see? He had brothers. He had brothers, that's true. <laughs> he does. That's see, that's there's I was thank you for bringing that up because that is 100% one of the things that I'm loving about this. Like Simon the Zealot, whether he was formerly a zealot or was currently a zealot, unclear. But what is clear is that at some point Jesus, who was himself not a zealot, but died a zealot's death, kept um, company with people who still, maybe it was Simon himself who said, what about the kingdom, man? Please, we need this. I've devoted my whole life to this. And Jesus is like, nah, bro, you're still here. You're still here. Yes? Good question. I actually don't have an answer for you. I will look into that. Hmm. Yes, and there were certain, I mean, the interesting thing is, at that time, if you, were, if you were going to places that were known to you, that was a fine thing. So it's... But, yes. So cool, a little over half a mile. So that is, huh. What's interesting, when they returned from the mountain called Olivet, that makes sense, actually. And the, lovely. Well, asked and answered, folks. Good work. <laughs> Some of them might have been brothers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. And then a white structure in the middle. Uh huh. And it's um, but it's very very interesting because in that place, which you can just it's right there. Uh huh. Yes. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I also, I when I was there, it was what was amazing to me, and this is part of the the reverence in in the Holy Land versus here, is like that little chapel, right? You can fit maybe four people in there at a time. It's a very very small thing. Um, I but the the utter kind of uh, barrenness of it, yeah. that the unadornment of it all. Um, so Matthias, these are the 11 disciples, right? Egalitarianism in the early church. Women were part of this from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, this is actually interesting. I think I, yeah. Um, so certain women is one of the things I want to focus on here. The... These are likely the same women who traveled with Jesus and bankrolled some of his ministry. Um, uh, Luke 8, as well as some of the women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife, I really got to start checking something, the wife of Herod, steward Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who ministered to them out of their own resources. Translation, they paid for Jesus to do stuff. From the very beginning, it was women who were bankrolling the entire ministry 
of Jesus. And they were a part, what I love here is that they were a part of choosing their leadership. There was some form of, we're doing this together, and they were seen as people who were a part of the community. Absolutely they were. Yeah, without the ministry and the, um, without the ministry of those specific women who went to the tomb on the resurrection day, there would be no... Ah, the witnessing. There you go. There you go. That's all it's always, that's what it's always been. And folks, I believe that we are out of time. So, and we don't have to worry. This is so lovely. <laughs> We're doing great. We will pick up here next week. Uh, talking about Matthias replacing Judas. Good work, all. Oh, no. Stop it.